From the KDLM studios in Detroit Lakes, it's HodgePodge with Carol McCarthy, presented by Partnership for Health, and now airing on TV3. Today on HodgePodge, my guest is Tara Getter, the director of the Pelican River Watershed District. Good morning, Tara. Good morning, Carol. Uh, well, uh, we are finally maybe kind of changing over to spring um, and of course uh, lots of melting going on and I know that you keep track of the ice out date on your website and we'll probably, maybe next month we'll be talking about that. But. It'll be a very exciting <laughs> moment I think for most of us. I feel a little out of place in my gray here because everybody here at the radio station is all ready for St. Patty's Day so they're all decked out in green. <laughs> well, well, yours is kind of green gray so we'll let you go with that. Uh, but Tara, uh, you've been working on a number of things, kind of behind the scenes, uh, working on developing plans and kind of looking at the big picture of things, of what the Pelican River, River Watershed District, uh, some of the goals and some of the focus uh, that uh, you will be looking at before you kind of get out into the field once all the snow and ice melts. Right. Uh, last week was exciting for, for us, especially for me. I uh, went to a workshop in Grand Rapids last week, and it was put on uh, regarding what our protection targets should be for our, our waters, especially looking at lakes. And we are fortunate in our area here, uh, unlike southern Minnesota lakes, sorry for those of you from southern Minnesota, but our lake water quality up here is much better than those lakes in southern Minnesota. And um, we want to keep the lakes in good shape. But at the same time, we as water resource managers, there's grant money available and it's harder and harder to, you know, get enough points to have a grant awarded to you when you, if you don't have dire straits or your lakes are in really bad shape and you need to fix them. And there's a lot more money that's required to fix a water body than to protect it. So our goal here is to have a management plan as such that identifies those water bodies that are um, of special significance for us that we want to keep protected um, and yet be able to vie for those grant dollars too. So we are learning um, this workshop helped us uh, look at ways to um, write our grants in such a way and present our data so that we would rank out a little bit higher. So I like that approach very much. Okay, uh, so you've got some tools to work with now as far as uh, what kind of factors do you take into consideration? Right, so uh, protection mode for the most part is would be like 5% reduction in, in phosphorus. Now that could equate to less than 50 pounds of annual phosphorus removal to more than 500 pounds of phosphorus removal. For instance, our Detroit Lake uh, phosphorus removal goal, for which is what we're implementing with our Rice Lake project, would be we want to reduce it from 3,000 pounds to 1,500 pounds. So we figure if we can do that, we should be able to keep Detroit Lake in fairly decent shape. So that is our protection goal. That's a real life example of what we're doing now. Um, now. In contrast to that, an impaired waters goal for, for instance, for St. Clair Lake, which is a much smaller water body, what we need to do to um, uh, increase that water clarity is to uh, implement uh, at least a 300 pound reduction. So that just tells you the scale, a difference in phosphorus removal that are, are needed to, rec um, to obtain you know, water quality goals. So we look at a number of risk factors for water bodies, and that would be, you know, are they in a in a watershed of high uh, economic significance? So if we look at, let's say, the lake shed of Detroit Lake, I mean, we're going to have high economic uh, significance for that lake versus maybe another lake that's, um, I hate to even say a name, but I'll just say maybe a more rural lake where you have, uh, you know, the property values are there, but not as, as significant as like, say, a lake like Detroit Lake or Long Lake, which is in the city limits. And then we also look at local priorities. Um, sometimes there's a reason and just locally, a locally popular spot, uh, maybe a, a tourist area. Um, those are the type of things that we would also look at too, uh, you know, prioritization. And also uh, looking at uh, biological significance, that's something that usually like the DNR will, they do their biological um, studies and Minnesota Pollution Control Agency and they may identify certain water bodies as having a high biological significance. We want to keep those and those water bodies in again equally uh, a good shape too. So uh, what we do, uh, uh, Brent Elcott with our watershed district, 
Um, we are, in fact, right now going through looking at uh, interviewing and hiring our s- summer interns. And they will go out this summer and start collecting all of our water quality data on the lakes. And then we take that data in the fall and winter time and crunch it down. So basically what we look at then is this water quality declining? Is it increasing or is it stable? So that's another factor that we look at too. And so those lakes that are um, are starting to decline, you know, we want to go, whoops, we want to make sure that we concentrate on them so they don't get to that impaired waters list. So that's another red flag for us. Um, So uh, another risk factor is how much impervious surface. I know, you know, the watershed district people talk about, oh, we have to get a permit and so forth. But really, if we talk about water quality and really want to put the science into it, the amount of development in a lake shed, especially near shore, of these water bodies is really a high, high factor in uh, looking at protection measures. So the more impervious surface that you have near shore or in that water body lake shed area, the more increased probability of uh, it could become impaired and there's less protection measures. So we want to increase that protection uh, risk factor um, and uh, lessen the impervious surface. So. All right, I'm in the studio today with Tara Getter. She's the director of the Pelican River Watershed District. We're kind of taking a look at the big picture, some of the planning process that you go to, especially when you write grants to fund your agency. It's it's key to really kind of hone in on exactly what you're doing and makes your job easier as well, I'm sure, and working with other entities, other governmental agencies and uh, governments uh, too, I'm sure. Um, so you're uh, prioritizing your focuses, uh, uh, a number of factors, as you just mentioned, and then you have to kind of uh, work on how to manage all that too, I'm sure. We do. So once we kind of uh, you know look at what types of protections that we need to start putting in place, we call there's a number of buckets that you can use. So for instance, would be you know manage it. So uh, ordinances are a type of management type activities. So whether we have the city of Troy Lakes is just in fact upgrading their, updating I should say their shoreland ordinance. Uh, Becker County has shoreland ordinances and Watershed District also has rules and they're all meant to help protect that resource so that we can have uh, develop it in such a way that doesn't, uh, or has more protection measures for that water resource. So that's one of the, one of the tools that we use. Uh, another would be for instance, uh, a forest management plan. So like our parks and recs departments here in Becker County and City of Detroit Lakes, they have a forest management plan. So that's another way to look at uh, managing those resources for those water bodies. Another would be in the ag area, like for instance, planting cover crops. That would be another, another manage it type tool. Uh, another tool in our toolbox, uh, a bucket I should say, would be to, to keep it. And that has to do with how, how much uh, public lands we have and easements and so forth. So. If your watershed area has uh, a higher percentage of public lands or easements or wetlands or public waters, that's also um, a plus in the column for protecting that water resource. So that's another good thing. Uh, Another bucket would be the, unfortunately, I call it the fix-it bucket. Mm -hmm. So again, those activities have gone on, but we're like, whoops, uh, we need to do some improvements here. So it would be like improving or upgrading our individual septic systems, um, implementing erosion control on construction projects so you're not seeing you know wa- uh, sediment you know, leaving the site. Um, feedlots, uh, upgrading feedlots um, and uh, implementing shoreland stabilization projects. So these all kind of wrap into you know what we do as a watershed district. Uh, right now we're going through our rules update, for instance. And we look at uh, we're meeting with folks that are involved with uh, permitting impervious surface. So we had last week had a group of engineers come in and say, okay, here's our rules. Here's what we're thinking about implementing. Um, you know, what do you think? Give us some feedback. So those were really good discussions that we had. And then uh, in the next week or so, we're also having another uh, meeting regarding those near shore activities. So we're inviting in contractors who work on those type of projects, our landscape architects will who do the planning to help us, you know, develop those, those rules. Um, you know, what would work better? Um, how could we implement those type of things for protection measures as well? 
So we actually use our data in such a way and try to implement, you know, real life activities that will help these water bodies. All right. Tara Getter from Pelican River Watershed District in the studio with me this morning. Tara, we're going to take a break and be back with more after this. Now, back to HodgePodge with Carol McCarthy on KDLM Detroit Lakes. Welcome back to HodgePodge this Friday morning, March 15th, 2019, mid-March. We're in the studio with Tara Getter from Pelican River Watershed District. She's the executive director. Uh, talking about some of the things they're working on during these frozen water months and uh, some of the other things, uh, Tara, uh, I wanted to get your um, input on Detroit Lakes. You know, we were talking about kind of your uh, work as an agency, kind of seeing the big picture and working now towards some of the more details of some of the things you want to focus on as a watershed district. I know that you as a watershed district have been on, uh, had had uh, committee members uh, helping to develop the Detroit Lake City Ordinance uh shoreland ordinance and now that is nearing approval they've gotten through one hoop uh first reading their second reading i think is going to be done on the 19th of march and then it's up to the dnr to approve the permit to enforce some of those ordinance yeah that was a very uh that the shoreland update was it, was it was a needed update and just like our rules are a needed update and working through the process, this is again where what I was alluding to before was looking at, you know, what are the goals of the ordinance as well as what are some of the local priorities that you may have in place. So for instance, um, into the Shoreline Ordinance now, we've built in some sort of flexibility. I call it flexibility option for, um, especially in those commercial areas um, where we can uh, have a little bit more development, I'll say this, more intense intensely developed areas. However, they're, they're held to a higher standard for water uh, quality standards, so to speak. So they will have to have increased water quality uh, factors when they apply for their permits if they want to have a, a larger site project, so to speak. So there's some flexibility built in. Before it was, you have to stay at X amount of impervious surface, let's say 25% or 35%, no going over it. Now they can do that, but there's some added stipulations that they must meet some water quality standards as well. So we're trying to protect the water resource while allowing for some additional development. So for instance, you can go up higher. You can add you know, more stories to your structure, mm -hmm. whereas before you were limited by height. All right. So uh, along with the process of development, um, developers still need to obviously um, go through the Detroit Lakes, get a, get a permit through you. Um, after, uh, yeah, certain types of projects qualify will qualify for the ordinance. Correct. Well, will will trigger permits. So, um, we we coordinate both with the Becker County Zoning Office and the City of Detroit Lakes offices very closely, and along with our activities. So, um, we kind of call ourselves the the you know the previous surface for the previous service permits and looking at those best management practices. We're kind. I will look at us as. We're kind of the, the know it's uh, the experts in that field. So we review those type of projects and see what the, the developer or the contractor, the landowner is proposing to do on the site. And we say, yes, that does meet that standard that we're looking for, for resource protection or not quite yet. You need to modify this application a little bit and then, and then it'll, it'll qualify or it'll meet our standards. So those are the type of things that we look at. We're more of, you know, providing assistance and, and helping out to make sure that we can have development in these shoreland areas, but yet also protect the very resource that people are, are enjoying. All right. Tara Getter from Pelican River Watershed District in the studio with me for a few more minutes. And uh, we're moving along here to, uh, you've got uh, also um, aquatic invasive species. Is that uh, something that you work with uh, hand in hand with the counties as well? And you are working on a readiness response plan and another, uh, another plan to hone in your focus on you know, certain aspects. I know we've got a lot of zebra, I think almost all the lakes now in the Becker County area or in the Pelican River Watershed District have zebra mussels. Well, those are connected by, you know, river system. Right. Unfortunately, when you have rivers connecting lakes, they become infested just by default, basically, so unfortunately. Now the focus is because that doesn't end aquatic invasive species. Now there's other bigger and even maybe worse 
uh, invasive species out there that we have to protect against? Well, we have different types of different uh, aquatic invasive species, and one of the, one of the ones that I'm very uh, worried about is starry stonewort. And that's within a two-hour range of us here. So, I mean, it's just being vigilant and hopefully with, uh, I know, Becker um, County Soil and Water Conservation District, they are working real hard to have our inspections at water accesses and so forth. And, and if we can keep that front up going, great. Um, if something happens to slip through, though, we want to be ready to move. And so what we are preparing right now is our, we call them readiness response plans for, we're taking a, a uh, first set of lakes, probably about eight to 10 lakes, and we're going to be preparing more detailed plans with. And we've also hired or contracted with Dr. Ryan Wurzel, who is now with um, Minnesota um, State University out of Mankato. And the neat part with Ryan is he, when he was an uh, undergraduate and graduate student down at Mississippi State University, he worked on our flowing rush research. So he's well aware of our lakes here in Minnesota, and he just moved up here with his family. And I think the worst year in history to move a family from <laughs> Mississippi to Minnesota with all this weather this year. He said his family's having a little trouble with the adaptation. So anyways, I said, don't despair yet. <laughs> so don't move quite yet. We need you. So uh, hopefully we can uh, keep him on board. But anyways, what he's going to be working on... Uh, uh, Brenda Moses at our office and, and myself, we're going to be um, meeting with um, folks from, you know, the city, the lake association groups and just in DNR. And we're, we're going to be looking at, okay, if we get an investigation, here are the steps that will, will occur. So people kind of know what would happen. And then um, Dr. Wurzel will help us with the more detailed plan. Okay, if you get starry stonework and these areas are, this is a, the, the area that you have, here are the type of steps you could use, whether it's you know, uh, hand removal to chemical treatments, you know, what would we do? And we're gonna prepare it for re Eurasian water milfoil, hydrilla, and for starry stonewort. Those are the three plants that we've picked to hone in on. So I've got, so let's say if we get something, at least I'll have a, a high, uh, a researcher who knows, you know, who can help guide us through it. And also with our getting our permits too, to have the DNR involved in this process to say, you know, here's our expectations. If we get this, I don't want to wait three months to figure out what we're going to do. We want to be able to act, you know, quickly and, and know what to do. And then we'll have uh, citizens involved, too, with this process so they understand what happens. All right. Tara Getter from Pelican River Watershed District, uh, my guest this morning on HodgePodge. Tara, thank you so much for coming in. Lots of information today, and uh, we kind of started out with, uh, you know, your website also has a lot of this information, what you've been working on, uh, keeps some data uh, for people to look at, uh, PRWD, Pelican River Watershed District.org. Um, but what is your guess for ice off? I have to end it there. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, <laughs> Charlie and I both, I say it, April 24th, so now it's on record. Okay. Mm. <laughs> Being the water. I will expert. say <laughs> April 17th. Oh, okay. See, there you go. So even the, even ahead of me, a week ahead of me. So they're, they're very optimistic. And <laughs> Tara, here's to spring. And thank you so much for coming in today. Thank you. And that's going to wrap up HodgePodge for today. I'm Carol McCarthy, KDLM.